just Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for this beautiful morning you've given us, Lord. We thank you for the chill in the air. We thank you for all the many blessings we have, Father. <clears throat> we just pray that you would bless our study this morning. We pray that you um, would just eliminate any technical difficulty that's trying to come against us this morning. Help everything to go smoothly, Lord God. I thank you for every woman that's already joined our call. I thank you for their uh, contribution to our community and who they are to us, Lord God. I pray you bless our study. Um, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. I hope y'all are all warm this morning. Um, I'm so glad to see some of y'all's faces. Um, without much ado, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Pastor Cheryl. She's going to teach us this morning. I'm so excited. And um, here we go. Take it away. You may you may not like me when I'm done. <laughs> I'll be stepping on some toes uh, here. Uh, so for a little icebreaker, uh, tell me, let's see, those of you that are married, can you tell me what colors that you picked for your bridesmaids to wear? Uh, or if you're not married uh, and you're wanting to get married, what colors would you choose? Now, I had a rainbow wedding. I mean, today it would not be a good idea, but <laughs> obviously, uh, but I couldn't make up my mind what colors. So I just chose them all. Nobody had colors. They're putting it in the chat, Cheryl. Oh, okay. So I can't read that. So yeah, okay. shiny, shiny can help you out with that. Um, so we've got lavender. Sheba says maroon slash burgundy. Anita says lavender and silver. Uh, we have pink. I had navy blue. Majoy says gold and champagne. Uh, Shirley says maroon and Carrie says lavender also lots of maroon and lavender so what years was was this Pete we get Pete from Suzanne let's see why well, no Lance and Anita were married in 2000 right okay okay Carrie says 1984 1991 Shirley okay. says Okay. All right. I just wanted to see what I, what everybody wanted. I got married in August. I wanted red, but they told me I couldn't do that. There was so many things they told me I couldn't do when I got married. So, but anyway, I just chose all the colors. So, all right, let's, let's pray. Father, as we come before you right now, we just lift up everybody here and we lift up your word. Most importantly, Father, I'm asking you to customize this to us as the women that you have created to walk in a sacred service, Father, that calling that you have put on our lives. Father, if I say, if anything is in my notes, if you don't want me to say them, Father, I'm asking you just to not let me even see them. And if there's something that's not here and you want me to say, I'm asking you, Father, just to bring it to my mind. And I thank you for that. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Okay, we are going to focus on how to produce a change in your husband. So when we're done, you should have some tools to change your husband. Uh, it may not be the way you want it done, but we're going to do it the way that God says to do it. We are going to focus on Titus 2. Uh, and I, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to read this from the uh, Amplified Bible, but I'm going to read it from... Uh, starting with verse uh, Titus 2, starting with verse 3, and I'm going to probably go down to verse 8, because at the heading of my, in my Bible, the heading of that section, it's called qualities of a sound church, qualities of a sound church. So anyway, it says, uh, bid the older women similarly to be reverent, this is how they amplified, to be reverent and devout in their, in their teachings as becomes those in, uh, engaged in sacred service, not slanders or slaves to drink. They are to give good counsel and be teachers of what is right and noble so that they will wisely train the young women to be sane, sober-minded, temperate, disciplined, and to love their husbands and their children. That's a tall order for us ladies. Uh, to be self-controlled, chaste, homemakers, good-natured, kind-hearted, adapting and subordinating themselves to their husbands, that the word of God may not be exposed to reproach, 
uh, blasphemed or discredited. In a similar way, urge the younger men to be self-restrained and to be and to uh, behave prudently, taking life seriously, and show your own self in all respects to be a pattern and a model of good deeds and works, teaching what is unadulterated, showing gravity, that is having the strictest regard for truth and purity of motive with dignity and seriousness, and let your instruction be sound and fit and wise and wholesome, vigorous, irrefutable, and above and above reproach, so that the opponent may be uh, may be put to shame, finding nothing discrediting or evil to say about us. At this point, in, at this point in time, we will get into those scriptures, but I want to give you a little bit of background. Paul, at this time, is leaving Crete, and he's been training uh, Titus on teaching qualities of a sound doctrine. If the behavior of the men, the women, and the children is sound, uh, godly, and biblical, then the church is going to be healthy. Marriages are going to be healthy. Leadership is going to be healthy. So according to Ephesians 5, when people view our marriage relationship, they should want to get saved. Wow. Uh, the world should see the husbands making their wives feel loved, safe, cherished. Uh, and protected, and they should also see the wives uh, making their husbands feel honored, respected, and accepted for who they are without trying to change them. Oh, did I say in the beginning we were going to change them? Ha! Huh. Well, let's see what God's got to say about that. Anyway, and if as families we are raising our children, then in the counsel and admonition of the Lord, then we should be in a sound church. Huh. Huh. Paul was instructing Titus to teach the older women, the mature and the seasoned women. He was not talking to Titus about teaching the younger women. That's not what he was doing. He was specific, according to just about every commentary I read. He's teaching the older women, but he is not teaching the younger women. And there was a reason for that. At that time, it was considered in poor taste for a pastor to teach the younger women because of the possible temptation and because the younger women had a tendency to idolize a spiritual leader inappropriately. Now, <clears throat> as a young Catholic girl, I may or may not have flirted with Father O'Connor or Father Fisher, nor any of my cousins. We were strictly told not to do that. I couldn't, I didn't understand exactly why we weren't supposed to, because if you could have seen them, they were just hot. They were the hottest priests ever. Oh my gosh. Anyway. <clears throat> okay. So but what we're going to do right now is we're going to focus in these scriptures, more specifically Titus 2, oddly, obviously about what they're telling women, what they're telling women to teach. And we're going to be camping at some point on the, on the fourth verse. The older women should teach the younger women to love their husbands. That's what we're going to focus on in a few minutes. But right now, we're going to look at verse 3 when it says, Teach the older women similarly to be reverent and devout in behavior as become those engaged in sacred service. Okay. The idea behind behavior includes a command but not limited to do how we dress and how we carry ourselves. Reverent behavior basically means suitable to sacred service and office, and it conveys the image of a priestess, a priestess, uh, a carrying out the duties of her office. I thought that was pretty cool. Sacred service and priestess. Okay, the conduct of older women must reveal that they regard life as, a, as sacred in all of his aspects. The word sacred means holiness. Holiness is nothing less than the conformity of the character of God. The character of God is found in Galatians 5.22. It's the fruit of the spirit. So God is calling us as women, single women and married women, to walk in a type of sacredness. He's called us to that. I mean, 
when I first started reading that is the different commentaries and the word they were using, sacred service, that pricked my heart in, in a, such a way that I thought, oh, my Lord, what is he calling me to do? So we're going to talk about that a little bit. I'm going to recommend a book about holiness. Uh, it's by Jerry, Jerry Bridges, and it's called The Pursuit of Holiness. Uh, it's an older book, and it's one of the best ones I've read out there about holiness. So let's talk about what the, when it's talking about sacred service and it's talking about the word uh, reverent behavior. What is that talking about? Well, that reverent behavior that it's talking about is talking about also the way we dress. So let's talk about that for a few minutes. Now, if you look around in today's world, there are lots of Christian women running around with their boobs hanging out. And this dress is, uh, as my husband says, they're short enough to, you know, you can look up their name and address. And so we as the older women are supposed to be setting that example in the way that we dress. Now, I don't mean we're supposed to dress like a nun. That's not what, what this is talking about. But when you've got young girls and they really don't know and they've not been taught Somebody has to teach them these things. And we, and older does not necessarily mean age. Mature does not necessarily mean age. I, I know some women that are 30 years old. They don't have the experience the older ones have, but they certainly do have the spiritual maturity to be able to convey a message. So if we've got teenagers, we need to be teaching them that they have to dress a certain way, but why? And sometimes the dads might need to step in and say, you know what, if you dress like this, this young man is already thinking in that direction, his hormones are raging, and you show up dressed like that, here's what you're doing to him. Here's the position that you're putting him in. Now, they're probably not going to understand that. You know, I didn't understand any of that either, but you understand it the older that you get. Okay. A sac sacred office uh, does not, it doesn't leave any kind of room for abusive language, for foul language, or flirting with people, men that are not your husbands. So let's stop for a minute and let's talk about the first question. So the first question is, how does it make you feel to know that as a woman and a wife, you serve a sacred office? How does it make you feel to know that as a woman or as a wife, you serve in a sacred office? Cheryl, I would say that even hearing you use those words, it's there's a heaviness um, that comes with it and not in a negative way, but just a weight of responsibility. I think in my mind immediately went back to even Adam and Eve. And how Adam had heard directly from God, but yet Eve's words were able to influence him to take a bite. And then now the world's changed forever, all right. because of her voice. And so, and I know that sometimes I see things that my husband doesn't see. And, and, and sometimes it's from my own perceptions and things like that. And I can plant seeds in him that I shouldn't have planted. So it's very, I, I'm, I'm hearing you and I take it very much to heart what you're saying. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Anu. Boy, that was good. Woo. That you're planting seeds in him that you never intended to unintended consequences. Wow. Wow. That's good. Anybody else? I'll just say, I, I think it's important to make that distinction that you did, that it is a sacred office because, um, you know, the world doesn't see it from that perspective. Um, and so I think to give it that gravitas or that weightiness of like, you are, this is more than just man and woman coming together and building a home together. Like you have a sacred responsibility to your family kind of gives it the sense of weight and responsibility that it needs. Ooh, that's good. The waiting responsibility. Ooh, I like that. Anybody else? Um, Laura says in the chat, our voices are powerful and for Father God to provide that responsibility is an honor. 
Um, Carrie says, I've never thought of it like that. And great points, Anu. So, wow, that's good. I love those comments. Okay, let's go on to the another part of verse three when it says we should not be slanderers. Okay. The word for slander is the same word that is used for devils. Ouch. When we slander and gossip, we are doing the devil's work. We are inviting the devil in to make the situation work. We are planting devil seeds. That's, that's a Cheryl-ism. Uh, we are pl we're planting devil seeds. We reap what we sow. In James 3.16, it says where there's envy and strife, there's confusion and every evil work. Envy and strife, there's confusion and every evil work. Remember, ladies, leaders put out fires. We don't start them. If you're in a sacred service, you're putting out fires and you're not starting them. It's very difficult sometimes when we are in a, a conversation with one of our Christian sisters, you know, and all of a sudden they're, you know, trashing the pastor that's and you're standing right there. And it's very difficult to remember you're in sacred service. You need to put out this fire before it goes anywhere else. You know, and one way we do that is we say positive things about him. Or we say, you know what? I can see that that disturbs you. Uh, could I pray with you about that? Whatever it takes to put out that fire. So let's look at the other part of verse three. It says, not given to much wine. Now, I don't want to step on anybody's toes here uh, because drinking is not a sin. What we do know is when we don't do anything in moderation, that it can become a sin. I grew up Italian. In my, in, in my grandfather's home, which I grew up there most of, most of my life, on the table was always set this big jug of wine, of red wine. Now, the difference in that and what you have today, uh, my grandmother made that. Back in the day, the grandmothers made that, uh, and it didn't have in, any impurities in it. Therefore, it was very difficult to get drunk on that. Okay, uh, so I, when we went to Italy a few years ago, your most your, uh, the wine there had no preservatives in it. So if you drank a glass of wine, it was like a pure thing. And you would have to probably drink a couple of bottles just because of the way it was made for anybody to actually get high. So I want to say that, and I'm not trying to tell you to be a prude, and none of this is meant for you to be a prude. But uh, this was a common failing of older women in the Roman and the Greek cultures. Paul recognized that this was a special challenge and it was to, and it was this challenge was so special. It needed special instructions from him to Timoth. I mean, from him to Titus, so that Titus could convey this to the older women. Uh, in Crete, the liability to these excesses was more severe than in Ephesus. Paul was talking about bondage and a slave to drink. Now, let's talk about our culture today. Our culture today seems to mirror the women in the Roman and Greek cultures. Why is that? My guess is, is the same for, for back then. They were dealing with things constantly and there was a lot of pressure on them back then to be a certain way. In today's world, you have, I'm not giving them an excuse. I'm giving you a reason why they go to something that wants to anesthetize pain. So you've got stress, you've got stress of the marriage. In today's world, uh, you, they have children, they don't have a job, they have a career. So it's like they're running the home, they've got a career, and too much pressure is on them. So what do they do? They run to alcohol or other things like that. And when they do that, 
they're thinking it's going to anesthetize pain. And that is a trick of the devil. If you, if you look at, at and I'm going to give you an example of two different runways. <clears throat> the first runway is like a lit up runway, like an airport runway. Okay. So you are, here it is, and it's all lit up with these beautiful glowing white lights. This is God's runway. And if you look down it and you could see all the way down to the end, you would see what God has planned out. He came to prosper you, to give you a hope in the future and not to harm you. And he knew you before you were ever in your mother's womb. So because of that, he had all the days of your life planned out. So there they are on that runway and it is lit up. What we're not seeing is things that he's put on there to when we get into stress or strife, things we go to to take care of that pain, to anesthetize it in a healthy way. But then on the second runway, that is the devil's runway. And it is light up or lit up with glowing lights and different colors and flashing like you would see in Las Vegas. I've never been to Las Vegas, but I am told there's lots of flashy lights. So here it is. It's just all lit up. But it is lit up with things that will anesthetize pain, drugs, sex, alcohol, what, whatever is their affairs. So if we're on the first runway and we don't have a daily relationship with Jesus through prayer and the word, which is going to be what is going to anesthetize that pain, which is going to be what is going to help us walk in that sacred service. And we get so down and, and, and dealing with anxiety and depression because we're ignoring that relationship with God, because that is what is producing healing in our lives as we go along. The devil's over here just flashing things up. Oh, look over here. I've got This is a quick fix. You can come over here and you can drink this wine or you can do this or you can have this drug. Oh, and, and your husband's treating you terrible. Here, I got a man over here. Oh, well, it, you know, you just flirt a little bit. It'll just be fine. It won't be. That's it, just fine. But what's actually going on there also is we have the Holy Spirit, which is our GPS. And you know, when you have on your phone, your GPS and you're driving along and you take a wrong turn, what does she say? Make a U-turn, make a U-turn, make a U-turn, make a U-turn. You just want to go, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. Because she's not going to hush until you do what? Until you make that U-turn. Well, that's what the Holy Spirit's doing. He's saying, girl, get off this path. I got something better over here. And he keeps at you and at you and at you with conviction until what? You make that U-turn and you get back over onto God's runway that is lit up with things that make your life wonderful and healthy. And you be able to deal with things in a very different way. But aha, as we go on down, because, you know, as time goes on, you know, when we're kids, we develop what we call um, ways to cope coping skills, coping mechanisms. And at a certain point, they don't work anymore. We use them and then all of a sudden, those things don't seem to work anymore because we're using the wrong ones. So the devil's over here making things, oh, oh, come over here. You know, look how your husband's still treating you with his way. You don't deserve that. Those teenagers, they got the smartest mouths ever. Come over here. Let me help you. Let's join the tennis club. And oh, and after the they play tennis, then what do they do? They go into the clubhouse and they sit there and drink the rest of the afternoon. I'm not saying don't play tennis. Don't go home and tell everybody, Cheryl says we can't play tennis anymore because it's not sacred service. That is not what Cheryl is saying. But you get the point of what I am trying to say here. Okay, let's look at the last part of verse three where it says teachers of good things. If the older women were having these special challenges, then they had special opportunities that God was giving them because he's giving them answers to situations. God can use their wisdom and their experience, what they've overcome as opportunities to teach the younger women. The older women can't teach these things unless they've got a relationship with Jesus. So their relationship with God uh, it, it's going to help them control that gossiply, gossip uh, tendency, the slandering that they might want to do, or a nest, or that desire 
to anesthetize pain. We are empowered through our union with him. And if we'll stay on that runway, God is going to give us the thing we need for that moment in time to anesthetize that pain. Teaching the younger women correctly by the, by the way we live or through our words. Ladies, that is a command. That is not a request. It is a command that we teach the younger women by word and deed. Again, a command, a command. That's a big deal. So now we're going to move into where I really wanted to get to, <clears throat> which is verse four. It, it tells us that the most important thing that we're going to live out and do is in our relationship with our husbands. And it is it says that we are supposed to love them. Let's look at that for a minute. That word love here is the phileo love. It is friendship love. Before we can be their friend, the word of God tells us in Ephesians 5.33 that we have to show them honor and respect and accept them for who they are without trying to change them. So before you can be there, it's just like any relationship that man has, even, even with a, a friend. That man always wants to be shown respect. Now, you're the only one that can show him that respect where it affects him. It changes him. There are other scriptures that talk to his children and say that if you honor your father and your mother, you'll live a long life and things will go well with you. Well, that honor and that respect is for the benefit of the children. You showing your husband honor and respect is for his benefit. So that has to happen first. With a man, it gives us this command to, show, to make him feel honored, respected, accepted for who he is without trying to change him. Well, and it says for a woman that for he is supposed to make us feel loved, safe, cherished, and protected. That's emotional for us. But for them, it's a two-step thing. They can't feel loved until we show them respect. It's a two-part process. If you ask a man, according to uh, Shanti and Jeff Feldhahn, who have written the books about men and women, and also Emerson Eckridge with the Love and Respect books, it will tell you that it's a two step process. That is their biggest deal. They have a respect tank. We are the ones that are responsible for filling it up before we can be their friend. So, what I'm going to do in, in these definitions and everything I've said, are, they're going to be in my notes, but I'm going to go into a, a deeper direction now we're going to camp on that scripture about showing them love but showing them respect first and and i have uh, i'm going to give you some words and the definitions you can write them down but they will be in my notes when i get them to you okay uh we're going to look at genesis 2 8 and 18 through 24 it says and the lord god said it is not good it is not good that man should be alone, alone. So we're looking at the word not good and alone. I will make him a helper. Helper's the other word. Comparable, which is suitable to him. This is out of the Amplified Bible. Out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field, every bird of the air, and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was his name. So Adam gave names to all the cattle, the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper that was suitable for him. I want us to look at the word good. We're going to define that from the Hebrew words, good. But it has the word not good in front of it, not good. So this is how we're going to read it. It is not good it's not bountiful or productive it's not pleasant it's not prosperous it's not the best thing it is not joyful and the word alone means he is separated from something so we're going to camp on the word joyful so the word joyful is talking about healing 
a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. And out of the Amplified, it says, a happy, joyful heart is good medicine. And a cheerful mind works healing. It works healing, but a broken spirit dries the bones. You are in a very unique and creative situation. You are equipped with a first aid kit that is on the inside of you that has all the tools that your husband needs to be healed from his past and from his present. And in the moment, if he's acting like a jerk, you do not come back and act like a jerk. You come back and you show him honor and respect and acceptance, meaning accepting him for who he is without trying to change him. You have partnered as a woman in sacred service. You have partnered with God as his is your husband's wife. You've partnered with him to help God out here. He wants to use you. He's chosen to use you to help heal this man. God is the one that is going to change him. But the only way that is going to happen in a marriage. Now, let me say this. When I'm counsel, when I'm doing marriage counseling, I always preface this by this. The principles that I'm giving them, the love and respect principles, I'm going to say they work, they work, they work, they work. If you will do them, the only way they don't work is if there's an addiction going on or if somebody's having an affair. You have to handle that before you can handle the love and respect concept. So if I sense that, I'm going to ask the right questions. I'm going to nail it. I'm sending them off to somebody else for the addiction. I can handle the affair, but I'm sending them off that way because we can't get into marriage. But that is how you change your husband. You're pulling out that tool. When God puts you two together and you say, well, this is my third marriage. It doesn't matter. It's the right marriage right now. You can't go get out of it. Don't go get out of it. God's put you in that spot to help change this man. So it's not joyful for him to be separated from you it is not joyful for him to be separated from you um one person in the marriage all it takes is one person to change if one person is doing what they're supposed to do they're inviting god in even though the other one is inviting the devil in who's more powerful so every every attitude we have attitude action rolling our eyes around whatever it is we are in a position to invite god in and it produces healing because you are joyful that's what god's saying you're healing you've been given that first aid kit so let's work let's look at the word helper you're a helper it means to aid and it also means Something that furnishes relief. You are like an extra strength, Excedrin. You are like an Advil. You are like an antibiotic. You are your husband's antibiotic. You are his Neosporin ointment. You are his Advil. You are all of that. Because why? Because God says so. It says you're joyful and that produces healing. And when that, when you're exercising those fruits of the spirit, God is coming in, you're inviting him in, and he is making things happen. Uh, Pastor Joel, uh, a few weeks ago, was teaching on the Lord's Prayer. And it, when it goes, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. His kingdom manifest is manifest when his will is done i love that that just rocked me i've thought about that so many times his will is done when we do his will his kingdom comes which means he gets off his throne and makes happen what needs to happen you are the person that god works through he's not going to work through anybody else in the same manner you're the one that carries that anointing in a way that nobody else carries it. I'm going to read to you a footnote out of my Bible. 
on Genesis 2.18. It says, a helper indicates that Adam's strength for all he was called to be and to do was inadequate. You were in a unique position. Do you know the word unique means cannot be divided in two? It means you're in a class all by yourself. There is no other woman for this man. I don't care if this is your 16th marriage. There is no other woman for this man. So. So the word suitable also means complementarily. We'll talk about that in a minute. The needed help, this needed help is daily for daily procreate, for procreation, for work, and to support through companionship. That word complementarily means you are attracted to what you need to help make things better. He was initially attracted to you physically, but once he got there and he's attracted to that physically, believe me, and he still is, he's now attracted now to what's on the inside of you. A man falls in love with you and stays in love with you and wants to be around you because of the way he feels about himself, about himself when he is with you. So when you are showing him honor and respect and accepting and acceptance for who he is without trying to change him, he loves that. That is like heaven on earth to him because nobody else is doing that. His boss may show him respect. His kids may do it, but not the way you do it. It changes who he is. Who's doing it? Are you doing it? No, God is the one that's doing that. So we're not going to look at verse 21. And the Lord God uh, caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam and he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib, which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman and he brought her to the man. Again, you're customized for this. That, the work, that rib is a very delicate thing. You know yourself, if somebody breaks a rib or it's bruised or it's cracked, if you laugh or cry, whatever, it is very painful. In the footnote on, on verse 21, it says, one, one of his ribs, one of his ribs, as in other creative miracles, you're a creative miracle. Ladies, you are a creative miracle for him. As in other creative miracles of scripture, God begins with a seed, such as a jar of meal, which Elijah ate for two and a half years, and the fish in the loaves of bread, which Jesus fed 5,000. The rib was likely chosen as representative of an intimate part of Adam's makeup. I want to say this to you also about your sons. Your sons have that need to be respected. And even as their moms, you can still do that. You can still get to them that way. But it is going to be that daughter-in-law that makes the difference. But still, all men have that weakness to be respected and accepted and honored. When I had said a wise woman tell me this when my son got married, you know, to that point, you are the woman in his life. He may not be able to remove you from that position that easily so you're going to remove yourself from it you're going to back off I said to my daughter-in-law after they'd been married two or three months I, I said Didi I want to say something to you honey uh, John Mack is my son he is my baby but he is not my man he will never be my man and later she came to me and told me how much she appreciated me saying that. She said, I saw how close y'all were. And I thought, I don't know about this. So I'm telling you, you may be the, have, be the person, you may be that mom that has to back off. But use the tool of showing your son respect. He'll start eating out of your hands. Okay. 
Verse 23, and Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. <clears throat> you know, when the animals were paraded in front of Adam, I mean, there's this puppy. Who doesn't love a puppy? The thing is, though, he does not need the puppy. He wants the puppy, but he needs you. That puppy was not a suitable helper for him at all. And then it says, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one. This is basically talking about a change in priorities. A change in priorities. He is leaving and cleaving to you, and you two are joined as one because he's now head of his house. He's not in submission anymore here to anybody else. He has his own family. We're not going to go into submission right now because that would take too long. But, but, but I will tell you this. <clears throat> the verse before all of that in, in Ephesians where it says we, should, we submit one to another. And then it says wives submit to their husbands. That word submission, one definition of it is showing respect and honor and acceptance. What you're doing is you are submitting to his need to be respected. He is submitting to your need to be loved and to feel safe and to be cherished and protected. So that's what's going on there. Now, so we're going to go to another scripture right now. Uh, and this is in uh, Proverbs 18, uh, 22. It says, he, when I first read this, it was really, I didn't, I just couldn't get it until I started studying in the original translation. So this was a long time ago because it, it reads in your Bible, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor for the Lord. Well, he who finds a wife finds a good thing. Well, that's any wife and they're not all good. So, but what it really says is he who finds a true wife, he who finds a true wife finds a good thing. And then that puts your husband in a position to have favor with the Lord. So what does it take to be a good wife? Well, uh, it means to uh, show him honor and respect and acceptance for who he is without trying to change him. That means we don't interrupt him when he talks. We don't tell him that he is wrong. Did you hear me? We don't tell him that he is wrong. We don't interrupt him. And especially when you've got him in front of people, you don't change what he's saying. You don't tell him he's wrong and you don't correct him. Let somebody else correct him. So wait a minute. Does that mean I never, never tell him that something he's doing wrong. Here's the thing. There are going to be those times, but you've got to earn that spot. Because if you're daily telling him he's wrong, or he needs to go to the doctor, or, or he, he needs to do this, or he needs to mow the lawn or whatever, when it comes to something really important, he's not going to listen. So you want to save that. And you want to put yourself in that sacred service and pray for him. You want to overdose him on showing him honor and respect and acceptance for who he is without trying to change him. That's a pretty big deal. Okay, First uh, Peter 3, 1 through 6. We're going to look at a little bit of this. This is a, this is a long scripture, so I'm going to take out just a few things uh, that are in here. It starts out, this is out of the Amplified, because when I read this, you're going to be exhausted. Oh, my gosh. This right here is sacred service right here, right here. In like manner, you married women, be submissive to your own husbands. Subordinate yourselves as being secondary to and dependent on them and adapt yourselves to them so that even if they do not obey the word of God, did we just talk about this? They may be won over, not by discussion, but by the godly lives of their wives. Uh, a lot, I hear this from a lot of women. My husband just won't talk to me. 
He just won't talk to me. He's just too quiet. Hmm. What I find out after a little while of talking to them and then I witness it is because she's correcting him. She's correcting him all the time. She's telling him he's wrong and she's embarrassing him in front of people. Don't do that. When John and I first got married, <clears throat> he was quiet. My cousin used to say, uh, he nods his head and that's not definite. And I thought, huh, but I couldn't get him to talk to me. And we hadn't been married that long. And God said, well, if you'd shut up and quit correcting him, he would talk. So I did. I read this book called Creative Counterpart by Linda Dillo. You, if you haven't read it, it's, it's a mic drop thing. I am telling you, I, I met her many years ago, but it was written back in the 70s. It's coming kind of from a cultural thing, but the principles are there. So when I'm reading this book, it's telling me, when John is talking to you, you put down whatever you're doing. If you're peeling potatoes, you're doing your nails, it doesn't matter, uh, any of that. You put it down, you look him right in the eye, and if he just gets out, hello, you focus on him and you make eye contact with him. Well, I started doing that, and within two weeks, he was talking so much, and he still hasn't shut up. True story, true story. Next verse, number two, when they observe, here it is, this is it, this is it right here. This is your toolbox, this is your first aid kit. This is your sacred service. When they observe the pure and modest way in which you conduct yourselves together with you, reverence for your husband, you are to feel for him all that reverence includes, to respect him, defer, revere, to honor, esteem, appreciate, prize, and in the human sense, to adore, that is to admire, praise, be devoted to, deeply love, and enjoy your husband. <sighs> There's your toolbox. There's your toolbox right there. Let not yours be the mere, merely external adorning with elaborate interweaving and nodding of the hair, the wearing of jewelry, or the change of clothes but let it be the inward adorning and beauty of the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible and unfading charm of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is not anxious or wrought up, but is very precious in the sight of God. The word gentle means causing him to be soothed. Causing him to be, how are you going to do that? You are going to say things that are going to comfort him. You are going to encourage him. You're going to show him honor and respect and acceptance for who he is without trying to change him. You know, when we try to change him and tell him he's doing it wrong, what we're telling him is he's not good enough for us. We're telling him something's wrong with him. The word quiet, gentle and quiet spirit, causes him not to be frustrated. Now, I want to make it clear what this is not. It is not walking around on eggshells. I work with women who walk around on eggshells, and it's not hard at all to see that when that is going on. So what is happening, she's walking around on eggshells. She's trying not to do or say anything that will cause him to be angry because she does not want to put up with his verbal emotional abuse. That's not what I'm talking about. And ladies, if you're if you're dealing with someone who is verbally and emotionally uh, abusing you, then we need to talk about it. You need to talk to someone that can help you with that and help you deal with that because that is causing you to become fragmented as a woman. It's become causing you to become disoriented on the inside of you. It's causing you to lose your identity. And what you're doing when you submit to his verbal and emotional abuse, you are coming into agreement with his sin. So you're just as guilty as doing it. So this is where boundary setting comes in. You cannot set a boundary without a consequence. 
Now, if you need, if you're in a position like that, you need to talk to someone who knows how to handle it. Because what I always tell women, that's not where you start. Where do you start? Filling up his respect tank. It doesn't matter what he's doing. You hold a sacred office. He does not have to behave in such a way that he deserves it. You do it because God's put you in that office. You're never exempt from that, even no matter what kind of a jerk that he is acting like. You always are operating in that sacred office. But what I usually do with women is I work with them for a while, training them to show him honor and respect and acceptance. And then after that, I work with them on setting a boundary with a consequence. And you cannot, a woman has to be ready to do that because she has to live with the consequence she sets. But that's way down the road if you're working with someone like that. So that was free information. That wasn't in my notes, but I'll put it there. Okay. Um, also, First Thessalonians 4.11, it says to study to be quiet. I probably sh shared this with you before. Um, I had a pastor to tell me one time years ago, Cheryl, you need to study to be quiet. You talk too much. You talk too much. A man only has about a 15-minute a window of opportunity for you to get across something important. So if you're trying to get a, a subject matter across or something you really want to talk about it, think about what you're going to say. It, it doesn't matter that, that you, this, you got this from a woman who had a blue blouse on or, you, or you're having lunch with somebody and she shared it and then you had, you know, you had chicken fried steak. No, here's, here's the subject matter. And you talk in his language to get that across. Okay, verse five says, For it was thus that the pious women of old who hoped in God were accustomed to beautify themselves and were submissive to their own husbands, adapting themselves to uh, as themselves secondary and dependent on, on them. Um, another time, again, we'll talk about, we'll talk about uh, submission. We just don't have time to do that right now. Now, Question number two, what surprises you the most about the unique influence you have when you show your husband honor and respect? What surprises you the most about the unique influence you have when you show your husband honor and respect? Suzanne, that is perfect. It is a unique position. It is a position of power. I'm so glad that you shared that. Uh, because then, he again, the, the obstacles removed. Uh, he's He's got to make sure that he's making the right decision. Because then he's going to go, oh, goodness gracious. So thank you. That was very good. Anybody else? So okay. Carol, can I read a Go couple ahead. more comments? Is that okay? Sure. sure. I know we're yes. running short on time. Um, yeah, we are. Sheba says our honor and respect can also stop him from making a mistake slash sin, the opposite of Eve in essence. Laura says I'm always pleasantly surprised by how it lifts our relationship to new heights of love, honor, and respect, how it lifts us individually to then come together for the benefit of compost couple. I like that. <laughs> oh, that's good. That's good. Okay. Uh, we're kind of running out of time here. So I'm going to hit a couple of more spots here. Uh, this is a footnote that goes with this and out, of, and out of another commentary about the scripture we just read. And it's titled a heart adorning of a helper. Remember, you're you're the helper. You the one that furnishes relief. You are the excedrin. Okay. Uh, the heart here denotes feelings and thoughts as the deepest, most inner recesses of our being. A godly woman in sacred service, abiding in the Holy Spirit, who himself lives in the hidden place of our hearts, can grow to learn and grow to learn a trust in the insight and understanding the Lord gives her because it's going to be customized for your husband. 
for your husband. Uh, with a gentle and quiet spirit, God wants her to bring insight and value to her husband with their marriage. She is to be adorned with a spirit that is not self-exalting -exalt or casting herself as her husband's teacher, yet they are still ordained to be and become full partners as the husband receives the day-to-day -day relational help God has given to him in his wife, in his wife. Very quickly, how are we going to make all of this happen and come together in that sacred service? It is going to be that through that personal daily relationship with God, through prayer and the word, that is where your power comes. You do not, in the natural, have it in you to show him respect. You have it in you to show him that phileo love. That's what you have. Love, love. As Emerson Eckridge says, love, 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 love. We can just love, love, love. We're going to love her, love him. Everybody's love, 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 love. Look, you're looking to that woman is always going to do that. She does not think about respect. That's foreign to her. So God is saying, if you'll sit at my feet, if you will pray, I am going to energize you and you're going to be empowered through your union with me. And I'm thinking we need to stop so we won't get to the last question. So, Father, I thank you for our time together. Father, I'm asking that you take each one of us uh, in our relationships with our husbands to let us know what that uh, customized first aid kit looks like for our husbands we know we're supposed to show them honor and respect and accept them for who they are without trying to change them but father give us a new illumination new insight into how to customize that for him father i thank you father that we make a decision today to embark on that journey to do that so that we invite you in so that you can heal him father and i thank you and give you praise and honor and glory for allowing us as wives to be able to do that and to trust us with those men that you've given us to call our husbands and to those that are sitting here that are not married father i am asking when you do bring that special man to them that they will already have some insight into how to treat him and i thank you for that in jesus name we pray amen amen wow that was incredible <laughs> that was really i i was sitting here and i was like i need to make sure i go back and listen to the, get this again you had so many meaty points for us and i just <clears throat> appreciate that and um i want to say this but i want to say this very like i don't i don't want to be um just i don't want to just say it but that was a very empowering study i think um, as you said in your prayer, for those of us that are married and for those of us that aren't married, um, this was very empowering, not in the way that the world empowers us to be like, I'm going to run my house, but in the sense of, hey, this is actually what submission is supposed to look like. This is actually what respect is supposed to look like. I think when you broke down those words into their Hebrew and just really laid it out very simply for us, it was very empowering of what our role should be and how we can really, like you said, change things in our household. So thank you so much for all of that. Thank you. I, I left out, I wanted to share this book with you. Uh, this is, I can't ever pronounce this person's name. Lisa. Turkhurst. There you go. Uh, <laughs> it's Good Boundaries and Goodbyes. She talks about, this is one of the, I've read a lot of books on boundaries. This is probably one of the best. What I like about this, she includes teachings in here or short teachings from her therapist when she was going through counseling for all the stuff she was going through in her marriage because uh, it didn't end well in the boundaries that she had to set. So you're getting like a double dose in here of some stuff. And her therapist is, was really great apparently. So anyway, good boundaries and goodbyes. 
Thank you for sharing that. Thank you all for joining us this morning. If you need to jump off, we understand. We hope to see you at our next study, which should be December 2nd. Um, if you can stay on and chat, we'd love to have you stay on. But if not, we'll see you next time and take care.